So, good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here on a Friday afternoon. Um, welcome to the Tony Cheeseman Foundation. Those of you that are new to us, the foundation is set up to promote, inspire, and support growth and community resi resi resilience through carrying on African rooted traditions in the work of Tony Cheeseman. So, those of you that have been with us, you've recorded your history. Um, done an interview or been to any of our events, it is very much about us telling our stories, our individual stories, our collective stories, so our experience is not just one thing, so that everybody can tell their story and we can keep our traditions, our history, our values alive, so that's the aim of the foundation. We like to work intergenerationally, so we like to work with the oldest members of our community, the most wisest members of our community, so that we can pass that knowledge on. So this is our eighth lecture, and it is about the reminiscence of our journey to the UK, however we came here, whether we came by boat, plane, or any other vehicle. And we're very privileged to have Cecil Gutsmore here. Harry will introduce him in a moment to give our annual lecture. Enjoy, after the lecture we'll have time for questions and in the best traditions, we'll break bread after that and have a little refreshment and be able to talk to each other. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, first of all, the introduction was done by our chairperson, Donna Hughes. Donna, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think I'll sit. <laughs> uh, I have the honor of introducing Cecil Gassmore. I've known Cecil for many years. Cecil, it's not the first time Cecil has been in New Ham. I remember the founder, our foundation, who we have named our foundation after, Tony Cheeseman, uh, was the person responsible for bringing him to New Ham in 1984 to give a lecture. And that was around GLC anti-racist year. So welcome back again, Cecil. Uh, Cecil Gatsmore is an African Jamaican. He first settled in the UK in 1961. A retired lecturer in Caribbean Studies, History, and Political Science at the now London Metropolitan University, and also the University of the West Indies, and that's Mona Kingston, Jamaica. Cecil remains engaged in research, writing, and activism on a range of race, class, and gender issues, including reparations for African people. His published work appears as book chapters, articles, and journals, including The Black Liberator, Marxism Today, Race and Class, Jamaican Journal on Interventions, Review of African and Political Economy, and as a journalist. The Jamaica Gleaner, Jamaica Observer, he has also worked on a number of films about African Caribbean politics and culture history. Cecil is one of our brothers who, whenever he's called on, he's always willing to serve. And today he's going to deliver our eighth annual lecture and he'll be covering why we came to Britain as Caribbean people some of the challenges they face, and the legacy going forward. Cecil, welcome again to the time, and it's a pleasure having you. Thank you, my brother. Hey. Unlike our brother, I'm going to stand. As, in, <laughs> as I get older, I find that the juices flow a bit better when I'm on my feet, so I'm standing. Um, I am honored to be with you and honored to have been asked to deliver yet another, perhaps a second, if his account of the matter is correct, Tony Cheeseman lecture. I know, knew Tony not massively well, but he was briefly a student of mine, I think, at Bulmersh College in, um, in, up there in Reading, and I met him on several occasions after that, an able, interesting man, including somebody with a wonderful voice. Yes. Is that him? Yes. yes. <laughs> and, and so, a, a remarkable brother, and it is good that um, friends and, and connected others in, in Newham have organized this um, foundation in, in his honor. 
So I'm pleased to be here for, for that reason. Um, and also because um, I can't see what else you would do other than trying to serve your community in the best way that you can. What else is there to do? So when you are called upon, and insofar as you can help and serve and share, that's what life is about. There may be other purposes in life, but I don't know them too tough and don't want to deal with them more than so. All right, so good to be here. Um, I don't know Newham all that well, and clearly it's changing before our very eyes. Um, and anybody who's lived here a while will surely be able to confirm that. What I do know about Newham, and it's not necessarily positive, is that in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, when our first people were coming here, not for the first time, but in the context of having come during the war, having come back and so on, and coming as a fresh lot, um, Newham, and in particular Canning Town, was one of the places where there was a race riot in the UK in 1948, along with Liverpool and Deptford. Fact. So, um, it, it, people who live here need to know that there's race riots in its history in exactly the way. And race riots for these purposes means white people wickedly attacking black people physically. That, that's what race riots, when we use it in, in, in this way, mean. So that is part of the history of this place in exactly the way that's part of the history of Notting Hill or Liverpool or Nottingham and almost anywhere else you care to mention at one time or another. So, I am to be sharing with you on our African, Caribbean, and more generally African presence in the UK since the Second World War. You will know, and if you don't, you ought to know, that we didn't just come in the Second World War and after. People from the Caribbean, Africans who passed through the Caribbean have been in the UK for the longest while. Slave masters took some of their enslaved people from the Caribbean to here, and sometimes more directly from Africa, to work as house slaves in their great houses. It's actually very well documented. All right? and, and after that, after the period of en enslavement, when um, the shipping industry changed from sail to steam. A lot of our people from the Caribbean and West Africa were on those steamboats um, shoveling coal. And a lot of them settled in what are called the seaport settlements or seaport towns. So Bristol, London, Newcastle, Liverpool, and so on had substantial African and African Caribbean presence. So there was nothing particularly new about our being here after the Second World War. We're here long before that, going through trials and hardships and achieving stuff as well. So if you go back and look, you will see that people came here and became medical doctors, became engineers, became lawyers and so on, and stayed here and practiced or went back to the Caribbean. Now, the, the, the post-Second World War presence relates to the fact that just as we had done in the First World War, and interestingly also in lots of other wars, our people, in addition to revolting against the British, <laughs> the British Empire, fought for it all over the place. So, enough of our ancestors, and you might find it if you have family, if you have family histories that you can properly explore, you might find that you have relatives who went from the Caribbean to West Africa, sometimes as missionaries and sometimes as soldiers of the British Empire during the 19th and early 20th century. And for that same empire, people came and served during the First World War. I know of a book called Jamaica's Part in the First World War. There's a book called um, The Empire at War, which deals with the First World War. And there are big, long chapters on the contribution that our people made in that 1914-18 war from the Caribbean, from all of the Caribbean islands. And if you go back and look in Kingston and, and, and Bridgetown and, and wherever else, you will see commemorative monuments to our 
willingness, willing participation in the empire's wars. So the last phase of that, and it's by no means the last phase because we're still fighting in their army. I went to Northern Ireland once and I went around the corner and there was a young man from here, black, on his you know, defensive position in Northern Ireland, in, in, in London Derry. I said, brother, what are you doing here? And he said, first of all, <laughs> I said, I'm keeping the peace. I said, well, keeping the peace for Christ's sake. And, and we had the group talk, and he wasn't saying that by the end of the group talk, but we were there. And if you look at the numbers of people who died in Northern Ireland, British Army, if there are pictures, you will see that a whole heap of our young men died over there, right? So we've been fully involved in this society. So the Second World War brought a whole heap, heap of us here, um, as um, factory workers, as woodcutters, and the woodcutters were brought from um, what is now Belize, used to be British Honduras, and, and they were treated terribly because nobody bothered to give them the appropriate clothes, and they froze <laughs> and had a really hard time in, up, up, up in, in Scotland, which is where they were chopping the wood. Um, and others came, volunteered sometimes. Sometimes they put their ages up in order to come. One of the people who did that was my uncle, my, my, my uncle Leonard. He died a few years ago. But you know, if you go back and look at your family history, you see that our people did that. So they were here. Um, he was in, in the, the Royal Air Force. For some reason, he, he en ended up in Hull. And he was telling me that if he came back to England, Kingston upon Hull is where he wanted to go. I didn't have him died before I actually did the interview with him to find out why, in God's name, anybody from the Caribbean would want to go back and live in Kingston upon Hull. But be that as it may, that is where he had a good memory of being here during the Second World War. Those people went home. He was one of them. One of the things that they did with us during the war was that they gave us trades. They trained him to be something called a wood machinist, accepting that there were no wood machine op machinist openings in Buff Bay, where we came from, and not very many either anywhere else in the island. So he didn't, was able to use his training as a wood machinist, so he joined the police force. And to reminisce a little bit, Probably as a result of the wartime experience, he drank a great deal. And my uncle, Leonard, <laughs> is one of the few people who drank so much that the Jamaica constabulary recommended that he leave <laughs> instead of being thrown out. And that goes to show, because policemen drink nothing in Jamaica, right? All over the Car Caribbean. So <laughs> if they're recommending that you come out, um, you, you know drinking holy. And actually, this is neither here nor there, but his nickname was Bacchus, which is the Greek god of wine, right? Bright man, lived until he was 70 odd, um, and, and so on. So the, 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 the wine didn't do him, or the drink didn't do him do, doing too much damage. All right, so those people who went back found that they had difficulties all over the Caribbean. Our brother here knows somebody, Billy Strachan, who was a distinguished wartime flyer in the Royal Air Force. He arrives back home. A job comes up, and he goes and applies for it. The job is at um, what was then Palisados, now Norman, Norman Landing Airport. Mm -hmm. There are two candidates. One of the candidates is a white Jamaican. Um, the man I'm talking about is brown skin, but by no means white. And the white man, who is his applying alongside him, says to him, boy, you're so distinguished, I'm bound to give you the job. <laughs> it's absolutely true, I <laughs> said that to him. And instead of giving him the job, with much more qualified than the white guy, yeah. they gave the white guy the job. Mm -hmm. You're surprised that he ended up here, where he completed his legal training and became a very distinguished lawyer, as well as a distinguished activist in the trade union and labor movement and communist party. Right? Billy Strachan. There's a little book about him done by a, a, a white guy that we both know, a good man, who was taught in Jamaica and so on. Leave that to one side. So people came back because the conditions in the Caribbean, this wasn't just Jamaica, um, were such that it made sense 
to strike for a living and an improvement in your status outside of there. And that's what our migration in the post-war period was. It was a migration as people seeking work and seeking betterment. So it was an education, educational and labor migration. That's why we came. And it applies to my father, who um, people came for different, different reasons. But my father was something called a wheelwright, where, some, where you made wheels for cars. And that's where the wheelwright notion came from. And it just happened to be in that moment, just after the Second World War, when nobody was making drays and carts and wagons anymore. <laughs> that were the way you, you, you made the wheels out of wood and, 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 and all of that, that, that stuff. And so he had a profession that was supposed to serve him his lifetime, but it disappeared on, under his nose. So that's why he came to England. Came in 1951. And as part of that story, which we all need to know, it took him 10 years to bring his family to the UK. I was the youngest of the three children, and I made it here in 1961, 10 years after he came. Left when I was seven, never seen him again until I was 17. In the meantime, my mother, in the meantime, my sister and my brother, the older ones, came, and then finally they dragged me. <laughs> the, um, the interesting things, right? We talk about achievement. What, and, and this is, this is typical. My father and your older relatives, and many who passed on, would have had to work all the hours that God sent in order to sustain themselves here, in order to pay for families back there, in order to look for housing here, in order to fund people to bring, bring them over and so on. It was quite heroic. Um, and my dad was unlucky that he had to pay for my mom twice because she sent the money and she'd give it to a travel agent and the woman's boyfriend teeth the whole of the money, not, 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 just, not just my mother's, but a whole heap of other people, right? So he had to pay twice. But by the time all of us came, he bought a house, in Neesden, where we live, so I never got through no hardship. There was enough rooms in the, in, in the place for them to have a room, and each of us to have another room, and so on. So I came into a kind of comfort that enough people didn't migrate into. So I don't have nothing to complain about at, at that kind of level. But going back to what I'm really wanting to do is to talk about what we have achieved in difficult circumstances. And be in no doubt, my brothers and sisters, that the circumstances were difficult. This is a racist place. And, and, and that admission about how they treated the Windrush generation is not just about mistreatment in the context of emigration. It's mistreatment in the context of policing. It's mistreatment in the context of education. It's mistreatment in the context of mental health services, hospital health services generally. It's systematic mistreatment of black people because this is a systematically racist place. Now, one of the problems that we have is that they can't deal with the truth of that. And part of the reason why they can't deal with the truth of that is that there's a level at, they at which they don't understand racism. The white community believes that racism is what the National Front and Hitler and those people in the south of the United States or South Africa do, right? That's how they understand racism. They understand racism as the extreme of racism. And so the stuff that they will do to you or me in offices and factories and so on don't count as racism. And when you hear white people saying, I don't recognize so-and-so as, as a racist, or I'm saying, I'm not a racist, what they mean is not that I'm not negatively impacting on that black person and all kinds of things that I do. What they mean is that I'm not like Adolf Hitler or like those people in the National Front or like George Wallace. That's what they mean. And we need to know that that is so. Because if you don't know that, you won't understand what they mean when they say, I am not a racist, when you know all the evidence to the contrary. Not so. Right? So it's important that we, un it's important that we understand that. <coughs> now, we are a community that has achieved all kinds of things. To some extent, it's been excessively 
individualized. So we achieved as families and individuals and less as communities than we should have done. So what do I mean by that? Enough people who came saw Britain as an educational opportunity. You know how many sisters who wouldn't have had a stone, a, a snowball's chance in hell of becoming a nurse back in the Caribbean went into nursing, qualified easily, and even migrated to the United States and became doctors or stayed here and ended up in the, in the higher reaches of the, the um, National Health Service. I know enough of them. My brother is married to one. And my sister knows enough of them because she spent a little time in, in, in nursing and so on. So we know them. And there's a real pattern of achievement there which we have to acknowledge and celebrate. That whole generation has, in a way, passed on. But sisters in nursing need to be something. There's an association of nurses that go into these, these, this, this kind of thing. So there is that. There is how we acquired housing when enough white people didn't even begin to understand that you could buy your own house. Right? We, as African Caribbean people, had the highest level of house ownership in Britain for years and years and years, decades. And some of us who were entrepreneurial owned enough houses. If you remember your, your, your newspaper stories, there was somebody called Slider Joe Winter. Slider Joe owned maybe 200 houses. There's a, there a man in North Paddington who owned hundreds of houses, a black guy. He married a white woman, and between the tax man and she and her family, they're all gone, <laughs> no longer in the, in, the, in, in, in the Caribbean community. And they were not exceptional, right? Not everybody got up to 100 and 200, but a whole heap of people owned more than one house, right? In Brixton and Streatham and wherever. It's a matter of fact. And then some of those houses turned out as um, local development policies changed, to work, be worth a whole heap of money. Some of them we should have held on to, but if you go and look, you will see that people took the opportunity to sell out, to save or pass on some of it, and to go and live in Thornton Heath or wherever. So that whole movement from one community into another one down the line, sometimes literally down the line, um, is, but there's an achievement there, right? Now, why and to what extent we didn't manage to convert that individual and family ownership into something that the community, as a community, could benefit from. It's great to be a community with enough householders, <coughs> but how might we, if we'd applied ourselves and be more trusting, have done stuff around using those houses as security for community development, business and other kinds of community development. So the individualized nature of the experience undermines it in the end. Yeah? Or so at least I want to argue. There's another area of achievement, the churches. Right? Um, people tithe. People give because, um, in part, but not just because of that, they found enough racism in the churches. And so anybody who's older, and went to a white church <laughs> and knows, knows something about what happened, right? So you went believing that the people were your brothers and sisters in Christ and find that they might have been your brothers and sisters in Christ, but they had a different conception of what that meant. And it didn't mean fraternizing with you as equal, right? So there were problems. My dad became a deacon in a church in, in, in Kilburn, which I used to go to, even taught Sunday school there, <laughs> briefly. And, and he ended up leaving. And I'm ashamed to say that I never once asked my dad what happened. But he never went back. And he never went back to any ch other church either. My mom went to a different one. <laughs> my dad, and he didn't stop believing in God. Right? But... He stopped going to church. So something happened in that place that put him systematically off English churches here. I speak of achievement, 
How many people here don't answer belong to a black only church that somebody or a small number of people put together and that grew into quite a significant foundation? Enough people, right? And when you go to funerals and weddings, you see it. There's next to no white people there. <laughs> right? because, because our, our community, believe it or not, is still racially quite solid. I mean, enough of our young people are marrying whites and so on, and a few people married white people a long time ago, but our community is still very racially solid. And the way you see it, not exaggerating, look around you the next time you go to a funeral. Look around you and see who is there. My experience is, and I go to a fair number of funerals for all kinds of political and community reasons, now white people are dead. <laughs> <laughs> and it means something. It means something. Now, those churches are resources, economic resources, that should have been converted and could still be converted into ways of helping the community. There's some entrepreneurial churches, there's some churches that are doing good youth work and so on. But not enough of that is happening. And then, and this is not myth, there's a black bishop somewhere in Birmingham who actually owned a plane, an individual plane for him to get around in. It just goes to show how this tithing and this dedicated giving as part of making your calling and election sure for the afterlife, how what it manifested in, in terms of hard cash, even filthy lucre over Yasso. Right? So, so there's an achievement there, right? Um, all of those clubs that we used to have, all of those, do you remember the West Indian Standing Conference used to organize flights back to the Caribbean. They used to charter planes and take people home to all over the Caribbean. Do you know that the government and the airline companies ganged up to kill that off? And kill huh? it off. Yeah, yeah, not true. And yes, they ganged up to kill it off. Um, that what, that's what happened. Now, it's very difficult to do that anymore. Right? So, and the West Indian Standing Conference, enough other African Caribbean organizations came into being and did stuff for our community. Now, um, the, the other side of what I want to talk about is how we have failed at the level of leadership and organization to do as much as we could have for our community. I'm going to talk to a few examples. I don't know Newham, but I know Hackney, I know Brixton, I know Notting Hill, I know Moss Side, I know Hansworth. And in all of those places, two or three decades ago, if you went and looked, you will, found, you will find that our communities had, as community organizations, control of a whole heap of resources, as houses, as motorway bays, as this and that and whatever. Yeah? They, they had been brought into existence through this or that grant, this or that effort. Some of them were bought. There's a place in Manchester, still owned by us, where some working men organized to buy a place and create a social club. It's still there. But if you go around Notting Hill, or Brixton, or Hackney now, and look around for the places that are controlled by us. Next to none of them are there. And there's a question as to why. Whose fault is it? Is any of that retrievable? You know, can we undo and regain some of those losses? There's some interesting struggles along the way. Somebody called Brother Herman, Edwards his name was, his surname, said, if you say, they, they got for him, he used to run a project called Harambe, somewhere up in north, right up here in north, this is east, isn't it? More north. Yeah. Um, 
Holloway Road, I think it was. Yeah, Holloway Road. Yeah? And it was called Harandu. The council did a grant, and they said, we want you to get a nice hostel where you can house these young people that you're helping properly. And everybody said, fine. And then Brother Herman said, by the way, you are going to let the trustees have ownership of the title to the premises, aren't you? And the council said, no. What do you mean, put the ownership of the property into your hands? What we want to do is pretend to have got it for you. We will hold on to the deeds. You will do the work there. It will remain ours. And sometime down the line, we will repossess it. Herman said no, and he fought a long and losing battle because that is how it was almost everywhere under those, 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 those grants. Yeah? That's part of the story. In Notting Hill, an organization that I was briefly chairperson of controlled two motorway bays. One of them was smallish, but it still had space for a restaurant, for a place where you could do food, or another place upstairs where you could do training enterprises and so on, it had gone. And we had another bay that we never managed to do anything in, in part because there was a bust up in the organization at one stage, and the man who had the most energy and most contacts within the, within the white system <laughs> lost the battle and left, right? So there's that. Go back and look, you will see that there was um, Grassroots storefront is not there anymore. The Black, Black People's Information Center where I worked is not there anymore. There's Mangrove, not there anymore, and so on and so forth, right? And it's a story everywhere, right? There's a bright sister who is making a study of the loss of property in our community, right? Sometimes it was silly. Um, Rasters had control of a whole street of houses somewhere down in South London. Um, I know somebody who knows about this thing who said, I repeatedly went to them and said, there are ways in which you can get almost permanent control of this housing stock. Mm -hmm. And I said, Rasta don't deal with, etc., etc., etc. Eventually, the council payment threw them out. Right? So, those are some examples. There is the carnival, and it matters. People think that, you know, it's just people stupidly jumping up and, and, and down on the street. And there's an element of that in it, but much more important than that. It economically generates a whole heap of money. Culturally, it's something that our people did out of that combination of African and European experience and suffering in the Caribbean, right? It's an important cultural achievement, just as reggae, and Calypso and all of those musics that we do, and there's enough of them in, in the Caribbean, are cultural achievements, and some of those are present in the carnival. Now, it was important that we control it. And there was a moment in the history of the carnival when, under somebody called Claire Holder, yeah. and a West African man, this matters, called Chris, what, I forget Chris's surname, brought the carnival to an extraordinary height of organization. They were getting in a whole heap of money by way of, um, not contracts, what are they called? Sponsorship. Um, Sponsorship. Hmm? Sponsorship, yes. From big companies. They had Nestle about to come on board. They had um, big companies, right? They had control of the stall income. And we're talking hundreds of thousands where the stall income is concerned. It must actually be more than that now. And there's a process inside of the carnival where the authorities decided that black people mustn't control well-organized economic enterprise like that. And they found people amongst us to mash it up. And they found people amongst us to tell lies against the evidence to mash it up. And it's been going down and down and down ever since. I was community working in Notting Hill in the 70s. And we could see a certain move being set up 
by the police after Carnival of 75. Darkus How and Me, amongst other people, recognized what was happening. And Darkus wrote in his, in his paper, Race, Race Today, and I wrote a letter to the actual authorities saying, if you proceed along these lines, there's going to be trouble. The letter still exists. It was actually published on the day after Carnival of 76 in the, in the Daily Mirror. Right? The, on, in one edition of the Daily Mirror, the next edition cut it out, but it's actually there. Right? And they continued, the, the state the police continued down the road, and there's a big bust up. Everybody knows that there was a big, they call it the Carnival Riot in, 19, in, 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 in 1976. But I'm talking about after that. Talking about after that, I'm talking about the fact that from the early 2000s, around about 2002, 2003, that is the time when the state, with the help of stupid and wicked black folk, folk like us, moved against the carnival, got them to agree to hand them the, the stall, control of the stores and the income from the stores. managed to um, squander over 200,000 that had been built up under the previous regime as reserves to buy a headquarters. And struggle, struggle, struggle since then. We come up to 2016, and I know that something is going wrong. I call some people together to say, let us rescue this carnival. We called it rock, reclaim our carnival. 300 and more people attend a public meeting. And it's clear what we have to do. We have a massive mandate to go to the police and say, you are wasting nine million per year on policing that's not achieving anything, even in your terms. Let us talk about do it, doing it differently. Going to the local authority and telling them we have the evidence that you are ripping off the carnival, you can't come to public meetings and say you're subsidizing the carnivals. They agreed, under pressure of the Grenfell moment and others, to do a, an audit. They expected us to agree with their version of the audit that was to be conducted. I wrote a different specification for the audit, and they agreed in part to it. And we now have an audit which shows how the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea for the past 20 odd years have been ripping off the carnival whilst coming and saying, we are subsidizing this event, right? There was stuff to do to talk to the, 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 the thing, the body that Khan runs. There's stuff to do to talk to the, um, to the Arts Council. And we could have done it. But the people who came forward for the leadership just weren't up to the task. And that wonderful mandate was squandered by us. We need a better quality of leadership in our community. And our young people must know that they have a duty to do better than you know, my generation and some of you who are younger than me have done in relation to running our community. My final example is to do with how we responded in the Windrush scandal moment, right? The scandal started, I don't know how many of you saw a television program on the Windrush generation. I had a little, I had a little appearance in it. The little appearance I spent, and the sister who also had a mini appearance, we spent a whole day <laughs> with the filmmakers. And at the end, they gave her that, and they gave me that, but at least we were there. And it tells a story, and it matters, that right from the start, the hostile environment was there. Winston Churchill, massive racist, was part of that hostile environment. And every other institution in the place was part of that hostile environment against we. Systematic discrimination, key. They signed in the aftermath of the Second World War, a law which gives everybody who is within the British Empire a right without let or hindrance to go anywhere you want. <laughs> That's what the 1948 Nationality Act says. It's in my father's passport. He came in 51, two years after that. 
They never expect anybody who looked like anybody in this room <laughs> to, to take up the offer, right? We've been here during the war and were here contained in Cardiff and Liverpool 8 and, and, and so on and so forth. That they could manage. But why are these people going to take up themselves and come back? And why are them friend and Pitney and wife going to take up themselves and come? And they needed to do something about it. But these are people who cannot admit to their own racism. And it was only on the basis of race that they were going to be able to stop us coming. So it took them a while to organize how to keep us out. From 48 to 61, when the act was passed, the first Emigration Act, it came into force in the middle of 1962, they were trying to find a formula to manage keeping us out, right? straight, unadulterated racism. So it's there right from the start, be in no doubt. And what they did after that was that people who had a right to come, they set about converting into rightsless people who sometimes were born here, sometimes came very young with rights that they got from their parents, and they spent time saying, you have to prove your right to be here. And no matter what evidence you gave them, it wasn't acceptable because they weren't seeking to allow you to stay. They were seeking to force you to go. How many people know people who went through that? Huh? And it was going on for years. And nobody took a blind bit of notice. Wow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Must be racism. No, we need to, we need to move. <laughs> so, nobody took any notice. To be honest, when I first heard that that was happening to somebody, I didn't understand what she was saying. How can you have the rights that I know you to have, and you're telling me that the Home Office has stopped you working, taken away your rights to medical treatment and all kinds of something, and telling you you have to leave. How could that happen? I couldn't believe. But it was true, and it was happening on a wide basis. And nobody, MPs, black and white MPs, weren't taking a blind bit of notice. And if they were taking a blind bit of notice, the Home Office was stonewalling, right? And that continued up until about a little over a year ago, when Dan Boss and them had to admit that the Prime Minister, who, who passes herself off as a liberal, who passes herself off as a liberal, was responsible for a real hardening of the practice of enforcing, transforming black people into illegal immigrants in order to force them out of the place. Now, the story of how that scandal became a scandal don't have to be told today but we have some african caribbean people who played an important part in bringing that story to, to, to light one of them is a brother called patrick vernon humble brother but crucial um on, on it and there are others now if the state the racist state is on the back foot if the Prime Minister has to accept that she was responsible for tightening up a, a, a condition, a, a practice, a set of practices of racist discrimination, how is it that we as a community manage not to make the best of that? And I am telling you that we as a community manage not to make the best of that. What do I mean by that? Clearly, our leadership ought to have been up to the task of sitting down together, setting up a little commission, finding who, not everybody, you need examples of people who had been impacted, who had been thrown out of the country, who had died outside of the country, who had suffered outside of the country, who would have their passport and their rights to work, and so on and so on. Whole heap of injuries, concrete, de definite injuries that have a legal 
existence as, as, as injuries against which you have rights to, to pursue compensation. What we should have done was ourselves work out how much these individuals who have been injured, including their families who'd lost relatives, who needed to be compensated for the loss of their relatives in these terrible circumstances, how much was due to them. You know, we left it to the state with the help of one black man and a bogus consultation. That's what we did. Yeah? And it gets worse because it was an opportunity to say to the state, what you know, you admit to have done this set of terrible wrongs against individual African Caribbean people. But the truth of the matter is that over and above that, you have injured our community. Those people are not just individuals, they belong somewhere, they're part of that mass of people who migrated into the UK, their children, their relatives. And our community had been injured. And we want you to not just compensate individuals at a level that we in, 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 indicate, indicate, we want you to compensate the community. In the Windrush crisis, disgrace moment, a number of things were happening, you know. One of them was that the Black Cultural Archive, how many people in the room have heard of the Black Cultural Archive in Brixton? Do you know that in that moment of the Windrush scandal, the Black Cultural Archive was having its funding cut? And it's not just them one, you know. Whole heap of other black organization gone out of existence. Funds cut. And we didn't manage to organize as a community a delegation to go and tell them what you're now. <laughs> One of the things that you have to do is to put some millions, substantial millions, into making those places viable. Because what you've done is funded them to fail. And we weren't able to do that. Just as having assembled a team of black people who said they were up to the task, I found that I was surrounded, there's some exceptions inside of it, I found that I was surrounded by a set of fellow Africans who didn't know what to do, weren't up to the task, didn't understand how quickly we had to move, etc., etc., etc. And the carnival is now in the hands of the local authority. They will tell you otherwise. They will tell you that it's being run by a community organization. The community organization is in fact the, the, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea once removed. The chair is a white man. There's never been a white chair of the carnival before. The chair of that organization is, is, is Board of Trustees is a white man. One of the leading people inside that is somebody from, called Ansel Wong from Trinidad. Right? And I say right out loud, fearlessly, that Ansel was central in that moment that I was talking about in the early, in, in the early 2000 of destroying the carnival on the basis of a set of lies against Claire Holder and the structure that was then in place, in respect of which there, was, there were audits from perfectly respectable or, um, auditing organizations. The charity mission was saying to the entities that were moving against the carnival, there is nothing wrong. We have the evidence that they're not stealing, that they put the thing on, on right? and all of that because the enemies, the institutional enemies, found some friends in the community yeah. who were willing to help them destroy it. Sure now, now, so our young people need to know and to be told in no uncertain terms that yes, we have achievements. Yes, we have bright people in our community, but we cannot be moving in the way that we have recently done at the level of leadership and organization. That if we don't do better, our community is going to just be crushed on the wheel of developments and, and, and racism. Yeah? And our young people have to know that. And they have to be told why they have to handle things differently from the way that their 
elders like me and some of my friends and so on have done it. Yeah? And, and so that is what I want to say. I want to say that we came here as a community of labor and educational migration. We saw the opportunity, we used the means in our presence. How much people bought house on the basis of partner money and susu? Right? How much people? And it's not just that. Have trip back to the Caribbean by landing in the Caribbean, this, that, the next thing. Right? We had economic cooperative means that we were enabled to do stuff that we chose to do by. Our young people may not any longer know or value or understand those ways of cooperative self-help. We've got to make sure that they do, encourage them to run partners. All you need is one trustworthy person yeah. and, and a set of others who know that it can only work if everybody puts in all of the hands that they are due to put in. I lived back in Jamaica for 10, 10 years, 11 years, from 97 to 2009. And for the first time in my life, a sister was running a partner on campus, as my granny had done. My granny used to run one in Buff Bay. My granny couldn't read a word. So little Cecil was the one. She knew all the people who were in, in, <laughs> involved in the partner. And she'd tell me who they were, and I write down the, the, their names in the partner book. It wouldn't matter that the book was there, because it was all in her head. But for the first time, so I'm saying that in order to tell you that I know about partners from his picnic. So, and for the first time, it would have been about 2002, 2003, I encountered a brother who went into a partner just to teeth the other people their money. Never seen it before in my life. But I saw that happen on the Mona campus when I was teaching there. So the level of trust may no longer be there, but we had to try. And people like that have got to find a way to read them out of the community, even to take them to the court, because that, that's, that's, that, there's a contract, you know. And it's a justice a contract can be taken to law, as it happens, right? It might not have anything written down, but a contract has been entered into by all of those people. And anybody who don't pay, they continue to pay after they get their hand, they're committing a crime. Yes, a yeah? So, our young people, we, start again with us, need to understand and be proud of what we've we done. We need to have a sense of what we failed to do and a sense of how we failed at the level of organization cooperative management of stuff and of leadership. And that has to be explained to our young people. And the last thing that I would want, like to say is that there are some organizations that are working with young people. And occasionally they invite me to talk. And when I go and speak to these organizations, I find roomfuls of young people who are involved in all kinds of business enterprises, artistic enterprises, etc., etc., etc. There's not much cooperative um, stuff going on. It's, it's too individualized. But having said that, that means that they're just like us in, in, in their approach to organization. So those young people have to be told what is happening. They have to told that they have to step up to the leadership mark, that they have to do so with higher levels of trust, higher levels of creativity, and so on and so on, because they have a duty of rescuing our community that has gone through the hell of being in racist Britain. Maybe I should say one other thing. Racist Britain, to my mind, is now comic, amusing, alarming Britain. These are people who joined the European community, the, Europe, the economic community in the 70s. And they joined out of desperation. 
the economy was going down the pan. They made three attempts to join. The third one was successful. And it was successful because it was led by Edward Heath, who understood what the terms were. Right? They have benefited enormously from being in there, massively. The factories that are left in Britain are because, Brit um, and especially the ones that are owned not by British capital. British capital don't bother to invest domestically. They put the money overseas. So the factories belong to Indians and, and, and Japanese and Chinese and Americans. But the, the factories and some of the banks are here because Britain is a bridgehead into Europe. That's why they're here. And Britain has benefited massively. Now, there have always been some people who have been against being in the EEC and then in the EU. It's true. They were a small minority in the Tory party. And their business was wrecking the Tory party in order to bring about some leaving the, the, the e, e, EU. Those people, on the back of the stupid decision by Cameron to call a referendum, in a moment when poor people would be persuaded that all the stuff that they had suffered in the last 10 years, as a result of a crisis that was caused by capitalist banks, and which they paid for, that somehow that was to do with Britain's membership of, the, of Europe, and that what they have to do is come out because they have our money, our loans, yeah. and our borders. Which poor people, black or white, have any borders and money and laws that they need to take back into Britain in order to defend? And then there were some people, black people like us in this room, who said, when Britain joined the EEC all of those years ago, they abandoned we, and if they leave Europe, they're going to come back. <laughs> I was on a show, radio show in Jamaica, talking about him. You know what the effect has been? I have a friend, just going by him. He taught here as a headmaster, clever man, degrees in law and economics. Wow. Right, brother. Wow. Right? And so he did all the right things, and he had some money back in Jamaica. Most of the money comes from here, because that's where the investment is. Pensions and all of that stuff. After Brexit, his English income fell by something like 20% overnight. Ask anybody who have friends out there what's happened in terms of money coming from here into their bank accounts and what they can buy with it, right? And just in case there are people who think that Britain can reorganize the relationship with Jamaica, tell me what they're gonna say <coughs> that was not already being so. The bauxite is done. And if we don't watch it, they will dig down the cockpit mountains in order to mine bauxite that they shouldn't be mining because the cockpit mountains are our watershed. It's what supplies the rivers, right? So um, it matters. While I was there, the biggest banana plantations closed down because probably as part of climate change, um, <laughs> Storms were passing through or close to Jamaica annually, and so they were having to replant their bananas on an almost annual or biannual basis. It wasn't worth their while. They went out of banana production. The bananas that are now consumed in Jamaica, apart from the ones that are, consumed, are produced by peasant farmers who have a few half bunches, come from Costa Rica. That's where it comes from. We've got nothing there to sell to a Britain that will reorganize this relationship with Jamaica. The same goes for Barbados and Trinidad and all of the other places. It's foolishness people think, thinking and talking, right? So here is Britain. They went into the thing, open-eyed, real benefits. And they told the people lies, shameful and shameless lies, about the benefits that they got from it. And now they're trying to bounce everybody, that minority who suddenly got control of the Tory party, um, trying to persuade their people that there was some democratic decision made in the 1916, sorry, 2016 referendum which has to be honored. 
There's nothing democratic about that mandate. There's an argument within the British ruling circle between Cameron and that other right, and, and Cameron stupidly agreed to give his ministers their head. And Boris Johnson saw the opportunity to tell lies to the British populace to persuade them that they had money and laws and, <laughs> and, and, and whatever else to protect by voting to leave and told them lies about the impact on them of Britain being in the EU, right? What has come up out of that is that if you didn't have a sense of how wicked and stupid the British are, you now have it. There, were, there was an odd African Caribbean person, continental African, who thought that somehow all these people were coming from Eastern Europe and replaced and, and taking our jobs. There was some little truth in that, but that was no reason to vote to come out of the out of, out of the, the EU, even though a few of us did. Truth of the matter is that the British hate everybody. They hate everybody. They hate white people who come from abroad and black people, same way. They hate we a little bit more. You remember that after Brexit, two people were murdered. They weren't black, you know. They were Poles. You know, remember? Somewhere in Essex. Right? We are in a very strange place that we have to understand and organize properly to be in. And that is the task that we have to discharge. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Brother Cecil, some time to drink, have a little drink while, while we think. So, we enter the part where this is our question and answer. So, we've covered a wide range of topics. So, from our presence here in the First World War, Second World War, we've talked about black community leadership. I just really thrown it open to the floor. The questions are yours. Um, I've got an opening question if nobody else has, but I will defer to the audience first. Ladies first. <laughs> All right. So, my question really is around what has come to be known, mm -hmm. the Windrush generation, mm -hmm. which I think is a little bit of a misnomer. Mm -hmm. yeah, please don't doubt it. Yeah. I think it's very reductionist. It talks about our community in a very small way. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about, so where does it go for us? How can we get involved in leading what needs to be put right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you, you're right that Windrush generation seems to say that we all came on the Windrush, and, and clearly we didn't. But when you go back and look at what it officially means, it means people who came in between 1948 and 1973. That's what it means legally. Yeah? Um, and in a way, what it means doesn't matter. Because what they were doing, and I repeat, right from the start, people who came on the Windrush and people didn't, who didn't from 48, they have been discriminating against their police. Um, one of the things that happened <laughs> during, during that period, and, and I mustn't tell more stories about the period that tried to answer your question, um, but one of the things that happened is that white racist young men saw and understood that the place in which they would get most protection whilst being racist was in the police forces. Yeah. Yeah. And they rushed into them and got away literally with enough murders and are still getting away with enough murders. Right? So, so the, the fact that Windrush generation is a misnomer is neither here nor there. We're actually talking about our community post Second World War and the fellow Africans who history had linked us up with who were here before that in Liverpool and Cardiff and Bristol and those, 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 those other places. And what I'm saying is not that I have all the answers, but I've given you some examples of situations in which we could have done better, needed to do better, 
the better was available to be done and known about in respect of, of um, the um, Windrush moment. We needed to organize properly. We needed to all find a group of people who would calculate, um, calculate what was actually people were entitled to. And also we needed to go to the authorities and to say that the damage you have done isn't just to us as individuals, it's damage to our community, and we need you to put money in at that level. I'm talking about a moment in which our people at the community level appear to have settled for a monument that's either going to be in Waterloo Station or in Brixton <laughs> outside the, at, at the, on, on Windsor Square, right? And I say, what are you doing that for? What, 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 how do you benefit from monuments? It, it's the institutions that are our monuments. And if we let them fail, or allow the state to underfund them so they fail, we'll be failing ourselves, and the fact that there's a statue there won't matter. Yeah? yeah. So, um, <laughs> the, the easy, and it's easy for me to say, but, the easy answer to your question is that we as a community need to do better yeah. around identifying problems, around identifying community issues, and organizing better to deal with those issues. And the whole set of them. How, what's happening around knife crime? There is no proper community effort around it, is there? Unless I missed something. I know there's at least one conference and that maybe a document came out of it. Nobody sent it to me, so I've, I've never, never, never seen it. But we still need on knife crime a conference, maybe over two days, in which one day will be devoted to how the state and the society by its actions and inactions produce the knife crime crisis. And I have in mind some things that they've already addressed. Like, I only knew because the son of a partner of mine, then partner, had imported a knife which came straight in through the post and landed on in, <coughs> inside her letterbox. And that's how I knew that these children could go online <laughs> and import knives from China that nobody stopped coming in. The same applies. It's very easy to get guns into this place, you know. Yeah. The other day, they stopped a young man with bringing in guns through Victoria, right? And the, the police themselves supply some of the guns. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And the best example of that concerns their murder of Mark Duggan. You know the gun they knew long before Duggan knew he was going to try to buy it was in the hands of one of their informers, the Metropolitan Police. This is a matter of record, people. In the hands of one of their informants who had used it to pistol whip somebody, blood and so on, on the gun. The man had gone to the, the victim, had gone to the police and reported it. And they had left both the assailant on the, and the gun on the street. And then, I don't know why they decided to murder Duggan, but that was a decision that was taken by a small squad within the Metropolitan Police to murder Duggan. And the way that they planned it was that Duggan was going to buy a gun which was in the hands of one of their informants that they knew about. And they were monitoring a process at every stage of which they could have conducted two arrests, one of Duggan and the other of the gun seller. But what they wanted to do was to shoot Duggan after he got hold of the gun. Yeah, I'm gonna pause you there. Yeah. I'm going to pause you there because you've taken us into another yep. really nice crime. But and that, that's yep. a whole different conference about mm. knife crime what we do with our young people. <laughs> sir, you had a question. Thank you very much, sir. We do have a mic if you need. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor. My advice is that 
100 today. But, one, two. Is it on? That's better. I have listened to all what you've said regarding economic, social, political, and awareness. I was listening to hear regarding the ex-servicemen association. Those people that came to England and died for England. And a couple of them get sent back into the West Indies. Now they've got the ex-servicemen association in West End Brixton somewhere, yes? Mm -hmm. And we as a next generation do not know much about those people. Yeah. Yeah. Can you enlighten us and tell us a little bit about those people? Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. All right, my brother. I don't have any problem with that, you know. I know the West Indian Ex-Servicemen's Association very well. And believe it or not, it's an example of the combination of, of success and failure that I'm talking about organizationally. They face the threat of losing their building right now as I speak, or certainly that was so a little while ago. As the ex-servicemen became older, and I knew some of them, um, keeping the organization afloat and the terms on which the organization had to be kept afloat became more and more difficult. If you go there now, and the last time I went was a little while ago, we're talking about a building in just just off um, Clapham High Street, yeah, um, something, something Manor Road. I, I know it well. We've had meetings there. So when you go there now, talk about my last experience there. I was dealing with white men because in that transition of the old, the, the African Caribbean men getting older and them not bringing in younger ex-servicemen of Caribbean descent and so on, one of the moves that they have made is to open it out to non, it says Caribbean ex-servicemen. And the white guys I was talking to, not a lot of them know, were cockneys. Nothing Caribbean about them, right? So it's not that I don't know about the West Indian Ex-Servicemen's Association. I think they're important. I know people who used to go on their parades, and some you know, most of them got old, some of them have, have, have died. They're, they're, still have, um, they're still on the Armistice Day parade, yeah. yeah? So I couldn't mention, and I'm not pretending that I mentioned all the organizations that we have done work through, and that are either still around, and almost always in difficulty. So I wasn't doing down the ex-servicemen's association, and a lot of my talk was actually concerned with the coming into Britain of men who fought during the Second World War and how they came in the Second War and then came back afterwards. And you can find them all over our community. Old now, the last one were almost certainly dying, but you can find them everywhere. And their contribution to community organization in places like Nottingham and Manchester and London and Bristol and so on is remarkable. So I wasn't doing them down in not talking about their specific organization. Okay. Sir? Thank, thank, thank you, uh, brother. Mm -hmm. It's always a treat to sit and listen to you wherever you are and whatever you have to say. It seemed to me that we have learned very few lessons mm -hmm. from the experiences that we've had. Mm -hmm. We forget about Panama Canal mm -hmm. and how at the end of that and when the canal was up and running and those benefits were coming that my people like my grandfather mm -hmm. got packed back mm -hmm. and lots of others, luckily for my grandfather, he kept links with his family in Barbados mm -hmm. that when they, get, when they got packed back, mm -hmm. they didn't even know anyone to go there. Mm -hmm. And they came back with a suitcase yes. and nothing else. Come from Cologne with a big empty trunk. <laughs> suitcase. Say if you had a trunk, brother, yeah. you were lucky. Yeah. They came back with a suitcase yeah. 
a few pieces of gold teeth in their mouth yeah. and a couple of chains mm -hmm. around their neck. Yeah. It's also we've learned haven't learned the lesson from those people who went to America mm -hmm. when the Americans had turned the war. Mm -hmm. Because the Americans only went in it when it was coming to an end mm -hmm. to pick the fruit and harvest mm -hmm. and so on. And when they were finished, packed back to where they come from mm -hmm. with nothing at all, mm -hmm. with just a new linger, a new accent. Mm -hmm. And then we've come here. Come here. I came here in 1954. Mm -hmm. And the street which said, when you walk the street, you see on houses, mm -hmm. it says, no dogs mm -hmm. or no black dogs people or are wanted. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. And if you knocked on the door, mm -hmm. they jammed the door, they slammed it, slammed yeah. it in mm -hmm. your face. Mm -hmm. And we sort of thing have, have learned nothing about that. Mm -hmm. Nothing about that. Kill the cocaine lie in the gutter for half a day. We're trying to fight for equal rights for people. And we've learned nothing about that. I may go soon to my grave. And we still seem <coughs> to have learned quite a lot. We have to tell our children. Two years ago I was at Kingsbury High School in this college, giving a lecture. When I finished, a young guy came up to me and did that. And he said, sir, is all that you say is true? And I said, yes, because I was telling them about the struggle. And I said, yes. And he looked around to me. He says, but how come my parents never mention anything like that to us? We haven't learned anything. But it's an important movement. None of us died there also, but we earned money and that relationship between Caribbean economies and people and, and the Panama Canal actually mattered. So it was, wasn't just a matter of going back without anything, although in the pattern of Caribbean migration um, in the, the 19th and early 20th century, um, there's enough stuff that still has to be talked about, including some of us went to Cuba, you know, voluntarily, yeah. not to build canal, but to do railways and, and so on. And then in the 1930s, during that crisis, they packed whole of other people back. There are some Gutsmores, relatives of mine in Kingston, who we call the Cuban Gutsmores because they were in Cuba and then got sent, 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 sent back. So all of that stuff is in our, is in our DNA, sometimes in our families and, 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 and so on. So it, it's, and there's so much that we have to tell our, our communities. You mentioned Kelso Cochrane. That, that those same, that he wasn't killed by the police, he was killed by, by white thugs, but the number of people that the police killed, including David Olawale in Leeds, right? And then all of the people in London and Manchester and so on, including Mark Dudley, right? We mustn't forget the boy in that stuck near the police station. Yeah, all of people, <laughs> see, all of these police people in, in, in custody and out of custody murders. So yeah. there's a, a lot of stories that we have to tell. And you're right, the youngster who said, how come my parents didn't tell me anything about that, is pointing to a real failure of family and community communication. Do you know why they attack black people? Do you know why? Do you know why they attack black people? Can I just give my point for a second? I'll take a minute. I'll, I'll say I'll take a minute if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. I think they attack black people because whenever I talk, I talk about I put it in the spiritual belief. They said he's got white woolly hair like him. Jesus Christ, JC, I come JC in the Bible, he's got white woolly hair. Mm. So, and when they made a film of him, they looked like a white man. Mm. They made them think they're the special ones. Mm. As the black people have the diamonds and they're the special ones. Sorry. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So, I'm, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, that's why I'm sorry. I'm not sure I understood all of it. I saw this brother's hand. He's got woolly hair. He's got woolly hair. Thank you, brother Session, for an excellent presentation. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, you did mention that uh, I made a presentation on the Panama Canal in Birmingham in May. And before I ask my question or make my comment to you directly, uh, it is possible that I'll be making that presentation at the Barbados High Commission next month. 
So if uh, Bennett's announced, the High Commissioner has agreed it, uh, Bennett's announced the date and everything, I would like to um, invite you all, yes? We're talking about repatriation of black people, but it was one occasion when black people were deliberately not repatriated. And that was after the Second World War in Italy, I don't know if you remember, yeah, yeah, yeah. Taranto, yeah. Mm -hmm. when they deliberately did not repatriate ex-servicemen for fear that they would go back to the Caribbean and tell people in the Caribbean about the conditions that they had experienced in the UK and Europe. And even to the point where uh, one black officer, a sergeant, was put before a firing squad and shot and others were actually mopped up, okay? But that's another story. Mm -hmm. What I really wanted to ask is you put forward an idea about the youth and knife crime mm -hmm. and having a two-day seminar, yes. okay, uh, to discuss it. But my concern is uh, how do we actually translate that into activity on the ground? Yes. Because that has to happen. We have to get people to start doing stuff rather than just talking about it. And for the last 50 years or so, um, a lot of people have been talking about ancestral trauma and all kinds of different things. And I've actually put together a presentation on how to heal ancestral trauma. But it may not sit well, it may not sit well with you because part of it has to do with forgiving and rising above and you know, esoteric stuff like raising your vibrations and other things like that. So how would you translate those two days of potential uh, conference and, activity, uh, and talk and debate into practical activity on the ground yeah. to get the funds to get other things going? Yeah. Okay, let, let me um, try to try you with that. Thank, thanks for the question. It's a good one. I want to return briefly to our brother's point about what, what was left out. The, on this business of, of Caribbean migration and, and people going to all kinds of places, again, it's in my family. The father I was talking about who came here in 1951 and my grandfather, my mother's father, were agricultural workers in the US just after the Second World War. My, I was born in 1944, and my father wasn't there when I was born because he was agricultural working in the States, and my grandfather was also there at the same time. And they didn't come back with nothing, you know, and it, wasn't, it, was, it was temporary work. It wasn't a permanent migration. It wasn't a long-term migration. The ones who stayed had to do what they call a skip contract. That, that, yeah, that, that, that's how they stayed. My father brought back enough to buy a little house to put us in, right? When he came back to Jamaica. Um, so it, that migration, that's how that one worked. People went to the States, they worked their ass off, they, they, they ran risks of being bitten by snakes and all kinds of stuff in the field that, that they were in, and then they came back with some money in their pocket. And while they were away, their designated relatives also got some money um, from whoever the other side of the contract was. I know about that too, and I, I can be closely connected with it. Okay, the, the, the great knife, knife crime thing. Our lovely sister caught me off, remember? <laughs> and I on, moved you on. <laughs> I didn't on, cut you off. On, on, on the knife crime, knife crime business. So what I was saying there is, yes, I think that we need a serious conference, and that part of it would focus on the failures of the state and this society. The fact that our children don't have any sense of either humanity or their Africanity matters. And it is this society primarily, although parents who don't have it can't transmit it either, it's basically the fault of this society. We've got nothing to educate the children with. They're just hanging out in the streets. I've yeah. seen them. Yeah. You know, um, Okay, so that side of that failure has to be understood and talked about. The way in which the capitalist market is marketing into our children's heads stuff about violence that's unbelievable, unbelievably anti-human and destructive. They don't know the difference anymore between 
you know, the fact that you kill somebody and then don't get up afterwards and, 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 and walk away in the way that, um, that, that you do when, when you're doing it, um, you know, on, on, on games, right? So there's all of that. That's one of the things that has to be understood. And then, on the other day, or on the other part of the conference, what is happening is not that our community is doing nothing, you know. Whole heap of people are out there doing stuff around knife crime and gun and knife crime. Whole heap of people. Some of them are idiots. <laughs> they don't have a clue. Some of them are just parents who are wounded because they lost their children and they also mightn't have a clue. Right? And then there's some bright and good people who are doing wonderful stuff. There's some church people, all of that. Now what we have to do is get together, look at what we are doing, and look at how we can organize to do what we're doing and what we need to do around gun and knife crime much better than we are currently doing. And a lot will emerge from any serious sit down along those lines. It won't be sitting down to talk for talk's sake. It will be about bringing together the people who are doing stuff right now, some of whom are doing foolishness, some of whom are just in it for the money, right? And instead of that, to bring it together in a program that can impact our communities, that can deal with the youngsters who are in their schools, that can deal with the youngsters who are in or not in youth clubs that the state has closed down, and so on and so forth. So, um, that's not a program, but I'm saying that's how we need to produce a program of necessary activity. And in the absence of that, the mess that's out there, everybody doing everything, frequently without sense, without connection, and so on. We need to try to stop that. That's what I was, would have said. And I would, yeah. <laughs> We're very timely, yeah. we have about... Yeah. Uh, just one quick question here. One of the things that keep coming up is how can we work closer with our African family that's from the homeland? Uh, because sometimes we don't seem to have that connection. Now. Uh, is there any thoughts along that side? Um, it, it's not necessarily an easy one. There's a, the, the place to start is that we do have ongoing connection and and that's where we have to start there's a history of connections um, if you go and look at that late 1960s moment when we were organizing in the moment of black power you will see the name obi Buna. you will see other africans were part of those organizations that emerged from 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 that moment so indians caribbean indians Continental Africans and Caribbean people were together in, the, in, in, in that moment. Some of that has to be recovered. Um, uh, there are continental African organizations that look very much like ours in the sense that they relate to their own nations back home, primarily, just as some of our organization, too much of it in its aging, relates to islands and Caribbean territories rather than, 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 than the whole, Ca whole, whole Caribbean. So, even though, for example, and as a matter of fact, some of the continental African organizations relate primarily to where they come from, they also have a broader thing. And so I have relationships with continental Africans. It's around race and politics. Um, frequently in the, 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 within the ambit of something that I call revolutionary pan-Africanism, which some people might actually call Marxism. Wow. So the, the main, one of the main areas of contact is, is around radical left politics. And, and there is stuff around culture. Um, the other day, I, I guessed on a radio program in South London, and I had a brother um, who was an Igbo who talked for six hours on the program that I run about Nigeria and Igbo land and, and um, all, of, all, all of that stuff. And then they came to our workshop in, in, in Brixton and, and others of them came. But they only came for the stuff that interested them and we haven't seen them since. I mean, <laughs> so, 
So it's, it's kind of problematic how to make links concretely, and I don't have any answer to that, but I'm very much in favor of that. And what you've got to do is find frameworks in which continental Africans and, and people from the Caribbean. Incidentally, one of the things that I should have mentioned is that West African youngsters adopted Jamaican language and music and lifestyle in droves in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And some of that has stuck. So they're there in what looks like the Caribbean community, and they're in fact <coughs> continental African. I have people in mind when, when, when I say that. Young people who were running sound systems that weren't anything to do with the Caribbean, but were in fact African. There's all of that happening. So it's not that there are no connections, but um, you have to recognize them, and then you have to find ways to build them and keep them together. That, that's what I would say. Not necessarily. Have question, please. Oh, you got, all right, okay, so you got one, two, three. So let's go that way. Good evening. Um, I've never heard you speak before, but I do like the choice of topics that you went to in this. Thank you, sir. History, as I've always been told, it depends on how the historian interprets it. Yeah. 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 And I've all, I found a lot of stuff in, you, in your presentation, which I would argue with you another time. Mm -hmm. But what came up from it to me is that a little old phrase is it, he who pays the piper calls the tune. Yeah, there's enough truth in that. And when you talk about community leaders and stuff like that, mm. most of our community leaders are in groups where we depend on funding. So therefore, they cannot be like, what's the word? Just go gung ho, because they know if they do that and offend the, the piper, they're not going to get any money. So that's why I felt that when yeah. you were I'm slightly too harsh on our leadership. Yeah. And when you talk about Notting Hill Carnival, which is dear to me, I understand when you talk about Chris, Chris Mullard yeah. and Claire Holder. I yeah. understand that. It was clear that Claire was one of the best leaders we had. Yeah. But, um, when you talk about that kind of stuff, there's so much stuff going on there. And that's the same thing again. They depend on funding. And anybody who knows anything about Nottingham Carnival knows that that should be self financed and we should have got sponsorship. Yeah. Like yeah. So yeah. you know where I'm going. And yeah. it's, just a, it's, not a, it's not a question, it's just an observation. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah. and I, will, I want to comment on it. You're, you're, um, you, you are right about who pays the piper. On, on the carnival, my big point about it is that Claire and them, especially Claire and Chris, had organized it in such a way that the auto, some auto, autonomous funding that didn't, that it depended on capitalist entities but not on the state, um, was, was in place and that was squandered by Mallard and, and um, Wong and, 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 and those people. And it was a crime against our community that, that, that they committed. I am unforgiving. In, in relation to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, on, on the business of being, taking money and cutting your wings in order to keep the money, some of that is happening. I know of a um, mental health group, and right now, what's happening around mental health is very worrying including what the local authorities are doing in terms of increasingly saying there is no scope for specific black mental health service, we're going to put it all together. And the people who are in the black bits of it are finding their, 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 their service cut and they can't fight them because they are dependent on, yeah. So it, it, it's frequently as complicated and, and, and as compromising as, as that. Whether the people we're talking about in, in, in that mental health sector actually had the politics to fight them anyway is a, is a, is a, is a, a moot point. I, I, say all, I say all of that in order to say that I once worked in a funded organization, Black People's Information Center. While I was working in the Black People's Information Center, I was also on the editorial committee of a, a, a publication called The Black Liberator. It was far black left, seriously Marxist stuff. It, 
working in the Black Leaders Information Center never, with money from the CRE, never prevented me saying and doing anything that I wanted to say or do. Enough of the people who say that their funding prevents them from doing and saying things are lying. Enough of them are lying. And if it turns out that that is so, the money is not worth taking. Yeah? So I believe that we are entitled to money. Yes. It's ours from, 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 this, from, from, from the state, and we are entitled to, to, to provide services that are specific to black people, and we are entitled, because we are in a racist place run by wicked capitalists, to make a politics against them. And they mustn't feel entitled to stop us making that politics because they are funding the services we provide, which they can't provide anyway. Go and look at the history of the treatment of black people within the mental health service. The misdiagnoses, the over-prescription of very deadly drugs. It's a long, long story, you know. Yes, yes, yeah? yes. So don't tell me that people are you know, <coughs> pulling in their horns because they are funded. It's more complicated than that. Okay. Two more questions. Sorry. Sorry. We, we have two. Sorry. No, no, she's coming to you. So I know you have. Hold on to it. We are time limited. So we do have a question here. It's your question, and I have a gentleman there. So we have something to do. We are only in here till 5 o'clock. So forgive me, I have to manage time. Okay. Would you like to ask your question? Um, I don't really see really having a future in terms of being a community because community sort of implies a movement going forward on us. I sort of see it as black clusters, sort of like gatherings like this because it really is just about self nowadays because you made a very interesting point about how can we have gone from being the highest percentage of um, ownership of houses to where we are now. Mm -hmm. Because, I don't know, if you just sort of walk around Green Street, you don't know this area, but come along Green Street, it's so Asian and Asian owned. You know, how can we as a race, um, just for an example, buy all of our hair products from the Asian shops. We, you know, the hairdressers, we rent the spaces, pay the rent to the Asian landlords, and then the workers go to the shops by all the hairdressers, all their hair products from Asian and businesses. So it's just like, um, we're never going to really progress if we don't really have that community-minded um, spirit to really have a political, financial clout. Because to be honest, how I see it, they look at us, black people, as a joke. Yes. Because they allow us all these atrocities to happen and we don't really are outraged enough to do anything really about it. You let anything happen to the Asians or whatever community and they will stand up loud and proud. So where I don't really see a future for us, basically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll you an answer. All right. I'm, thank you so much. And simply because of time, I know you've asked several. So, so I just want to say something, and, and I think it's important to say. And I'm a little bit with Vasco, in that there is a place for forgiveness, and there is a place for not being the victim. And sometimes, I'm not saying you, I'm saying us as a community, sometimes we talk about what is always done to us. I want you to know that in this room, there is a father and a son working together doing something for their community. In this room, there are people who are not paid to put on this event for you. There are people that have got up overnight, cooked for you. Uh -huh. We can do for self. And it doesn't have to be something huge or great. We can have conversations every day of greatness with the people in our lives. Tell your children that there is something for you to do. When they are playing on that video game, you want to ask them, have you ever thought about coding? Have you ever thought that you could do that? Marcus Garvey said we should have a scientist in every family. 
every family. And we can do that, even in our conversation, a conversation that raises us up. So we buy our hair products from Asians. That's what we do. But you and your friend can get together and buy your hair products together and send it to the next person. Yes. You can start in a yes. small way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing is that yes. we never, we start, we stop. We start, we stop. And I feel passionately about that. Because I'm thinking, okay, every year we come together, we talk, and we try to move on a little bit each year. So I want everybody from here to go away and think, actually, I can move on a little bit. Because we are not powerless. We have innate greatness in us, and we just have to seize it. And if we're in conversations with people where we feel our needs are not being served, you have to say that. You're talking about the mental health service. You're absolutely right. Because the people, the mental health service doesn't think about us the way we think about ourselves. How is it going to recognize that culturally, socially, our needs are different? When you go to the hospital with a friend, a relative, anybody that looks like you, Ask questions, challenge. There are simple things that we can do to help ourselves. And the more you do that, it's a positive feedback loop. If we go the other way, we're gonna continue in this negative feedback loop. Small steps, one grain of rice. My parents used to say, one, one paper. Thank you, I just, I, I just, 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 when, when, when are people talk about our sort of mental illness, they say... The odd. No, I don't mean the odd. I, I, I don't mean that. I don't want right, to come around to my mind. I'm going to ask you. Can, can okay, thank you, sir. So, when, when, when you talk about the mental illness, let's say you've got depression, you've got mental illness. So, if I ask my job, I'm depressed, I've got mental illness. So, if I ask my partner, I've got anxiety, I've got mental illness. So, what about people that do man to man? They've got mental illness. I call it, I call it brain psychosis. Yeah, sorry, so I've got to do it. It's like what, when, when, when you react to sport, what's about transgender? A man has this bit, a woman has that bit. Is that a mental illness then? I'm going with what, what they say. They say mental illness is this. So I'm calling it then, have you got a mental illness? No? You, 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 you have to drop your depression, you've got a mental illness. You also partner, you've got anxiety, you've got a mental illness. And gay to gay and, 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 and transgender, they must have mental illness. I've got a great psychosis. Psychosis, you're, dis you're, you're, you're react is distorted. Just like this gentleman said, he said he's doing research and, and so I've been passionate, I'm not, not being violent, I've been passionate, I'm not being angry, I've been passionate. He said done research and he says this and that, I'm giving my take. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. The mental health of our community is important and you're right with your view. So you were the last one and then we've got a really important job to do that I have to do. <laughs> I didn't to know what to do. Now you give me my hand. There's so much, there's so much I said today, yes? My advice is not here with me at this particular moment. So, only thing I want to say, let's all of us leave here today and remember what was said and take a little piece of it home and work on it. So we will not have the same problem next time we arrive in this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 This organization, I was invited to join this organization by somebody, one of the members who's not here, Joyce Granderson. And we've stuck together. Um, sometimes we don't even have 100 pounds in our bank account. Okay, so I'm not telling you that because I want your money. Yes, I'm telling you, I am saying that because that's what it means to us. So it's always our pleasure and our honor to respect the people that have worked hard for our community. Um, a lifetime of dedication, unsung works, unsung acts that people sometimes don't recognize, that small kindness that has made the difference to somebody's life along the way. So at every lecture, we honor our community champions. And we're really honored today, and I keep using the word honor because it is an honor, to stand on the shoulders of giants, and to honour Winston Pinder, who is one of our founding members. Winston, would you like to stand? This is Winston. And our other community 
Beauty Champion will be honoured today is Miss Perla Bryce. So we have, uh, ladies first, Ron, would you like to just say a couple words about Perla so the community knows why we're honouring Perla today? Okay. Can you get up here? <laughs> Mine is little, but it means I'm weak. Okay, come on. It's the spirit, it's the spirit that's going to move you, Ron. I hope you ain't getting that, Ron. No, you're getting that. <laughs> no, I'm getting it. I am old. <laughs> Ron. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, while well, you were enjoying yourselves today, I was doing my bit for prostate cancer at Cannon Street Station. That's the reason why I'm late. Now, I, I want to make some remarks about someone who's been special to me from the time she was oh, 18, 19 years old. And when she became an adult, she also played an important part in this London borough of Newham. Now, that person I want to speak about, five minutes to most, maybe ten, is Perla Dash Boyce. I refer to her as a woman of substance who strives to live a life that means something and chooses to participate rather than to speculate. Wow, wow. The years I've known Perla, Perla, I can say without hesitation, she was always influential, ambitious, and conscious of goals that make her stand out in the London Bar of Doom, the London Bar of Southwark, no, um, and the London Borough of Greenwich, now known as the Royal Borough of Greenwich. Mm. And uh, as a social worker in Southwark. In 2010, Perla was part of a steering group set up by the Association for Prostate Awareness to commemorate the life of Tony Cheeseman, who died from prostate cancer. The steering group, through APA, applied for and received a loan from what was known then as Doom Council Vector Consortium. After successful carrying out three community events, a recommendation was born, was formed, uh, from the, fun, the foundation on its behalf. It will be remiss of me not to mention the influence Tony Cheeseman had on Perla. They were schoolmates at the Morden High School together, like I was, and we always refer to our motto. Any Latins? On the side, nil me I s r d i. It simply means nothing is too difficult for me, and we always think about that when we go to do things. Um, we shared the Tony and the Perla shared the same views. They were conscious about black and Africanism, and uh, throughout their lives. Now, making it short, Perla was elected treasurer and served in that capacity for a number of years. And as TCF grew, Perla opted to have a change. This given up her role as treasurer. However, when called upon to assist in any capacity, she's always remembered her alma mater, nothing is too difficult for me. Well done, Perla, and thank you very much. Come on, Perla. Come on, come on Perla. <laughs> This is for you for the hard work to carry out over the years. I wish you well. to say a couple of words. <laughs> I'll try to say a little bit more than a couple. <laughs> but Tony Cheeseman has always been very dear to my heart. But before we got the Tony Cheeseman Foundation, I want you all to know that Tony was a social worker in Lotion. And I also worked in Lotion. And we applied, well, he did most of the donkey work. He applied for the grant from the CRE. And that's where we set up the, the first workshop in Newham. So you people who know where McDonald's is <coughs> in Forest Gate, that's where the Tony Cheeseman, we call it Newham Black Arts, mm -hmm. Newham Black Performing Arts workshops. 
And we had other organizations who were able to come and use some of the space that we had. Tony was hard working. And we started working, as he said, from a, a belief, from a dream. So when you go in your kitchen and you open your cupboard, you take out your biscuits and milk and coffee and sugar, and you take it for a meeting and feed those people. We didn't have money. So we use our own resources. So it's quite important to note that we rise. And when you talk about the phoenix rising from the ashes, that is so literal. But however, thank you all for recognizing me and recommending that I get this award. And I will always treasure it. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it is also an honor to be able to present this award to our ex-chair, hard-working brother, friend, Winston Pender. But I'll say a few words to you, Winston, and I'll make it personal. I knew of Winston before I met him. Uh, you, don't, you don't get one present for Christmas because his birthday is also on Christmas. So he was always very unique. Uh, but coming to this country, I came across Winston. And I will use this here to share a little something about Winston in Newham. It said special exploratory meeting held on Sunday the 30th of September 1979 at 175 Sharon Avenue, Manor Park, London, New Six. Who lived at Sharon? I did. <laughs> oh. Okay, that was 1979. And this was a meeting. And the, on the mention present were T. Cheeseman, Vice Chair of the African Caribbean Organization, myself, Mrs. L. Cumberbatch, uh, Mr. J. Jackman, Mr. A. McAllister, Mr. R. Reed, and Mr. Yard and also Mr. Pender. But going through all of this, there was something that attracted me to share, to give some idea of the character of Winston. Winston said here from the minutes, Mr. Pender was surprised to find that he was classified as a guest speaker and not, one, not as one of the group, because although he's general secretary of the main Afro-Caribbean organization, he was at a meeting for the same ends and means of the others were. Well, that highlight that Vincent is a very humble person. I also took the opportunity to use my contact with Vincent while I was a youth worker to, with his permission, he became my non managerial supervisor. And in those days, when we were in youth work, and I presume social work too, you were given the privilege of having someone to give you supervision outside of your management, and it was all paid for. Uh, and Winston has really shaped me to make me very much the thinking person, the active person, the committed person to our people. It's basically through following Winston leadership. I, part of my college work, I was told that I have to take on a new experience. And part of that next new experience, some of my colleagues decided to go and spend a week in a monastery uh, and just do something you've never done before. I said I would like to go abroad. So I turned to Winston and I said, Winston, why do I go to the continent? Winston had contacts in Holland. And I was able to go there and spend two weeks, just, the, just like that. No planning, no nothing. And Winston, that was one of the most interesting experiences I've had. And that is making contact with African people from the Caribbean, but Suriname and Curso and Aruba, who lives in Holland. And Winston was there to help organize them before he was able to offer me that opportunity to go there. Uh, later, I took a group of young people to Barbados as a youth worker. And Winston, as my non macho supervisor, guided through me that. So you know it was all a very great success. So again, 
Uh, thank you for that, Vince. Thank you, Mr. Stanton. Most recently, Winston was recognized by, I don't want to use the word Windrush, but this is the Windrush Foundation, which was before the whole Windrush term, because they were going for quite a few years. And for their 75th anniversary, they had you in here as one of the pioneers and champions. And in it, it said, Winston Pinder, after cutting his political teeth in the Caribbean, Winston Pinder became a pioneering youth worker who left a legacy in more ways than one. And I agree with that. Winston, we are pleased and proud to honor you at the number 20 She's the Foundation. find time, as I do with my children, to tell them about my experiences, to tell them about the struggles that we went through, why they have the type of so-called comfortable life that they have, because my parents did it for me, and I'm doing it for them. And I think that if a young boy in college can ask me, why didn't his parents tell him about that all the time before? I think it is time that we all, whether we are parents, whether we are friends, whoever we are, to spare some time to tell our young people about the experiences that we have. We can be teachers, we can be lecturers in our own rights to our youth. And if we 
put that aside, I think we are doing them a disservice. I am a simple man doing my duty. <laughs> Right, so thank you once again. Just to say thank you very much for attending. It's been our pleasure. If it's your first time with us, we hope that we'll see you at our ninth annual lecture. Just a real thank you to uh, you just stand up, the working members of Tony Cheeseman Foundation. First, let me just thank you. And you're absolutely a working member, so you need to stand up, Miss Shirley. Who's always proud to see you do the work. Harry, so, Harry, can we have a group picture, please? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> can I just say thank you to them for giving them a round of applause? Thank you. Would you like to stand up? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for coming. Then you can take it. Come on. <laughs> there you go. Um, once that's done, please join us. There's some refreshments there. Uh, very nice. But come and wet your mouth.